So, can I pray for you? Oh, let's just extend a hand out to this wonderful man of God. Lord, we just bless him. Let's see the we bless the name of Jesus. I just feel it right now. So three times. Ready, guys? We bless you in the name of Jesus. We bless you in the name of Jesus. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. That was a good prayer. Amen. Thank you. I love Jesus. How about you? In fact, what I want you to do is I want you to stand up again. And I want you to tell somebody next to you something you love about Jesus. Just one simple thing. Just something you love about Jesus. It doesn't give you anything you like about Changing Atmosphere Art Show, and so there's some art, out, a little bit of art out in the lobby, and then most of it's across the parking lot here, and I just hope you don't miss it. So, go at least go one of these weekends, uh, and uh, right after the service, till actually till till three, I believe we, we're going to be open today, and then next Saturday from noon to yeah. noon to six, and next Sunday after the service as well, and uh, you know I just. Uh, I love, I'm an artist myself, but every one of you are artists in your own sets, in your own way. Every one of you are created in the image of God and you're creative and you have, you have an imagination that God uses to shape and form your life and to bring forth life and creativity in the world. And so, so um, sometimes when we say artists, a whole bunch of you freeze up. How many of you perceive yourself as an artist? Raise your hand. Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. More than I thought. Um, but then some of you don't perceive yourself as an artist, but the reality is that when the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters, over the formless and void waters at the beginning of creation, uh, and uh, he, he, he brought, it was, it's interesting about that, there's three things that were going on there. It was formless, it was void, and darkness was over the deep. So that means there was no shape, there was no life, and there was no light. So when, when, he, when he was hovering, he carried all that. And then God's, the Father speaks, let there be light. And there is light. And, and things began to happen. And in that cre creative light, uh, uh, all kinds of wonderful things happen. Well, so light, uh, light in the scripture is a huge uh, theme. And we're constantly praying for that spirit of revelation, that spirit of light that would that would shine on us and bring forth the multiple colors of creation. And uh, light also, clearly in, 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 in the Gospel of John, we understand that light actually is, uh, it, he is the light of the world and his light and his life is released through, through light. So that's kind of fascinating. So one of the things, that, uh, one word that I've been enjoying, uh, that another friend of ours coined is eyesight. So one of the things I pray a lot for is eyesight. I like iPhone, you know, eyesight. But what it basically means is I'm looking for Emmanuel. I'm looking for God with us. So Emmanuel sight. And so I'm constantly looking all the time into uh, the creation of around me, into times of worship like we just did, into the faces of other people, and looking to see where's Jesus. That's the big question, where's Jesus? And, and uh, those who 
our artists, and especially those who have a heart for Jesus, they understand that part of the whole creative process and what is going on uh, in, in, the, in, a, in an artistic project is where some, some facet of the beauty of Jesus, some facet of the beauty of God, uh, is being cherished, is being brought out, is the color is the shape, the texture, the form. There's beauty that comes out of it. Um, so I said we're doing an art show, and I, we've often encouraged our people that maybe they don't think they're not a painter, or they're not, they don't draw, or they don't do sculpture, but uh, there's uh, lots of other forms of art. So one of them is poetry, and uh, it's really cool because my wife just came up and handed me this this morning that our precious Chris, Christina Alvarado wrote last night, um, and I have been encouraging her you know, we need your art too, and that's your poetry. Um, and we've had some poetry nights, and so I want to read this because it's a perfect picture of uh, what an artist's heart is all about. So, what does an artist do? That's called the artist. What does an artist do? They attempt to capture a moment in time. They try to express a scene, a glance, a view of life that reflect an, that reflect an emotion, a feeling, a sense of awe. Artists want the viewer to understand, to see in depth, the amazing reflection of creation in their pieces. They desire that you would be so moved by the art that you would take time to observe the colors, the strokes, the flow, the design, and the shapes within the work. But we are more than an artist. We are a reflection of God's handiwork. We image that which has already been created. And we, in our simple ways, want to inspire others to see the glory of God in all things. So dear viewer, as you look today at this art, let it inspire you to realize that you are living and breathing, you are a living and breathing work of art, created by God to inspire others to see God's glory in you. The last little foot phrase, see God's glory in you, you know, in Ephesians 3, it says we are his poem, we are his workmanship, his poema, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he pre prepared for us to do. So every one of you are uniquely designed for a, a unique uh, activity and, and works to do that is a poem from the heart of God, just like this, 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 uh, this that we just read speaks about. So each of you is a, is a work of art. And each of you reflect a different color, a different uh, flavor of who he is. So, um, we just, I, I just love the thought that the most beautiful art in all creation are the people that God created in his image. And Jesus, when he came as a man, he showed us the ultimate picture of what a man could be. But he not only showed us the ultimate picture of what a man could be, he called forth the ultimate, uh, the ultimate call of what his bride would be. A big theme that comes all through Scripture, and part of the reason why we have this wedding dress up here today, is uh, the relationship between the church and Christ as bride to bridegroom. A uh, huge metaphor, huge image, all through the Scripture of that relationship. And we sing about it a lot, and we pray about it a lot. And so uh, we, I just wanted to put this up here. We've had it here for a number of weeks because we've sort of had a theme this summer about this. And uh, our friend Sydney uh, Galbraith, uh, uh, who's from Canada, you know, very gifted as a prophetic artist and just constantly getting all kinds of revelation. Well, she's had a heart for many years uh, to do this piece of art, to represent and call forth and uh, the, the restoration of the identity of the creative bride of Christ. So, so the, the release of, of creativity, but the release of the bride of Christ being purified, being set free, being activated to be the full, uh, the full identity that Jesus died for and called forth for. Uh, and so all, all around the dress, and I can turn it around, you can see a little bit, there's just been painting different points where people, she just has invited people, our various artists to come and write poetry on, paint different pictures. There have been many prayer sessions where we prayed and, 
and then create it on the session. So in one sense, it's an intercessory dress. It's like we're crying out for the body of Christ to be shaped and called forth in many different ways. And, uh, and so there's lots of, you, I guess you could say there's lots of anointing on the dress just because of all the intercession and the revelation and the prophecy all around it. And it, but it's a picture of we want to adorn and, and bring forth the body of Christ and to, to be the bride and in her beauty. Well, at one point she asked, actually, I want to just read something real quick that she wrote about this, just to explain a little bit more about this. The imagery and symbolism of marriage is applied to Christ and the body of believers known as the church. The church is comprised of those who have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and have received eternal life. Christ, the bridegroom, has sacrificially and lovingly chosen the church to be his bride, Ephesians 5. Just as there, are a, a, there was a betrothal period in the biblical times during which the bride and groom were separated until the wedding, so the bride of Christ separate from the bridegroom, uh, is separate from the bridegroom during the church age. Her responsibility during this betrothal period is to be faithful to him, um, and I'm going to add, and to create what we were designed to create uh, in this season. And then, as he returns, the church will be united with the bridegroom and the official wedding ceremony will take place with it. And with it, the eternal union of Christ and the bride be actualized. So, this is, a, what, uh, this is what you are. You are a member of the body of Christ. Each of you individually, in one sense, even you men, are the bride of Christ. Um, you're all, and all you women are the sons of God. So, uh, you know, we can just mess with the genders a little bit so um, sometimes that's a little harder to understand but the reality is he's after a purified and a created bride and and that's what he died for when he died it's interesting you know how in the in the story of Adam and Eve that when when uh, when there was no there was not found a, a partner for Adam uh, he put him Lord put him to sleep and and he took a rib out of his side and he created Eve from the rib well, I'm sure some of you heard this before, but just think about the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, they pierced his side, and, and blood and water flowed out. So it was it was a it was a connection there. And so the new Adam, the second Adam, the, the great Adam, uh, uh, his side was also pierced as he went to sleep uh, to bring forth the bride of Christ. And and so as our the bride now is being brought forth has been betrothed to him and all over the world throughout the nations uh, people are coming to Jesus and becoming a part of that bride and, and being released in the beauty and the destiny of who they are um, that's what it's after and so there's a there's a process of not only coming to Christ but a, but a process of maturing in this love and this release of our identity each of us individually in our lives are in a, in a lifelong process of finding out in a sense who we are who am I? Who am I and who are my people? What is my identity? So that even the, the, when you grow up as a child, there's this whole process of discovering more and more, who am I? But oftentimes things get tweaked along the way. From very, We have trauma, we have a, a lack of what we need, we get stuck at various places, and we begin to develop different responses to life that often cause us to not be who we really are. Uh, to begin to put on masks, to begin to get uh, to, to uh, deal with pain in a, an improper way, and begin oftentimes we get stuck in some form of addiction or some form of, of uh, self medication to be able to make it through the hard things of life. So there's a process, there's a war over our identity um, that we're constantly working on, and and it, and at the core of that war is a war over our own heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, our life flows. And so if we lose heart along the way, uh, that, that's, that's probably the worst, the worst loss of all. And so what we're contending for. So Sydney actually at one point asked me to paint something on this. I haven't painted anything on this. And, and I was like, okay, Lord, what do I, I, don't, I didn't know what to do at first. And, uh, anyways, oftentimes, I, I, I think for anybody who's creative, who's sort of like... Uh, you have to really kind of know you want, you're going to do this project. But uh, if you feel insecure about it, it's like, I don't know if I want to paint on that dress and mess it up, you know. Okay, so 
But then a few a few days later, I felt like the Lord said uh, exactly. He just reminded exactly what He wanted me to paint on that dress, and um, and He reminded me through reminded me of a story of a friend of mine, a guy named Steve Scolos. Many of you know him. Know him. He had a dream a few years ago. In the dream, he was taken to heaven, and he was standing in line to go in through the gate of heaven, and there was somebody standing in front of him. You know, going in and being kind of checked out in one sense, and, and this guy was uh, must have been a famous evangelist or something. And anyway, he was going on and on about all the crusades that he's done and all the people that he led to Christ and all, all, all the healings and the miracles and everything in his ministry. And like the story in Matthew, where uh, you know Jesus said, told that story, and the, and the response was, "I never knew you." Well, he got this guy got turned away at the gate, and. Uh, Terrible for him, you know, I don't know the whole, but anyway, then Steve's up next, and so he's freaking out. He's like, oh my gosh, if he got turned away, what am I going to do? And so he comes up uh, in his dream to the gate, and he stands there, and as soon as he steps into the gateway, his whole body becomes transparent, and he's like shaking, terrified, and kind of like, oh, now what? And he looks down, and he can see his heart. And you might project up there, there's a blue heart picture, if you just do that for a minute. Um, he looks at his heart, and his heart is on fire with blue flame. And he then he looks up, uh, he, and this is just kind of a, uh, a picture of a human heart with, with blue flame on it. It's like his, his heart is on fire with blue flame, and he looks up, and there's Jesus looking straight at him. And he points at his heart, and he says, that's what I'm looking for. That's all I'm looking for is passion for me, is that longing, that hunger. And that was enough. That was enough to get him in heaven at, in an instant. And, and when he said that, it just, we both got rocked. If he told me the story, it's like, we're, we're both kind of like, oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> There's just, a, 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 just, it called for something in the core of our being that was just like, oh, that. That's what it's about. That's the center of where it's all going. And no matter where you're at in, in, the, in the battle of life, even, even uh, many times in my own life, but also praying for people, I've noticed that when people are in agony, like they're, they're depressed, they're angry, they're frustrated, whatever, underneath that frustration is this longing. The, the longing talks about in Romans 8, all creation groans. For the you know the bringing forth of the sons of God, there's a longing for a reality. I know C.S. Lewis talks about the fact that okay, so so if someone if someone is in the desert and they're thirsty for water, that means there's water to be found. So it's it's like we're in a world that's longing for something more. So when you when you're uh, travailing, when you're in, in your frustration, remember that the Holy Spirit is in you longing and groaning and travailing for something greater and uh and you know we all go through it all the time i'm, I'm gonna be honest with you last night i preached and I, and I was like in pain i was like i, I it didn't work for me and i was like yeah you know, i left this thing this sermon last night saying oh, i never want to do that again oh. so but that was a longing because there was something deep in me i wanted to share and i couldn't get it out Okay, so so just to un understand it that way, instead of amplifying the, the pain or my failure, to, to, to remember, no, there's a burning heart inside of me. There's a burning heart for Jesus. I want to see Jesus, and I want people to see Jesus, and I, and, I, and I want them to be called forth to the next level of their maturity where they would burn for Him, and that they would be able to go through whatever next challenge it is, but they also could be for bring forth the creative beauty of who they uniquely are and be their real self and not give up and shrink back and put on a mask and be somebody that they're not. So, so I mean, I was trying to be creative. I mean, I am a creative person and when I do stuff, I do weird things. Okay, so you're used to that around here. I do weird things. So after last night, I'm thinking, I better not do any more weird things. But then I was like, no, this is me. I gotta be me. Through me, okay. So, so that's why I still got the bride dress, and I'm, and we're, you know, we're just gonna keep going after this, and I'm gonna still keep celebrating these precious artists that are among us, 
and, and uh, these precious introverts that get put to the side, and all these people that have treasure in them that uh, get shut down, and, I, and that's what we're after. And so, if you feel like that, I want to, I want us to pray for you later on. Like, where have you been shut down in your call and your destiny? Where the the greater works that He wants you to do, that you he, you are uniquely designed to do, uh, that, that need to be called forth. That's what we're after here. We want you. We want your treasure. You, we want your painting on the dress. We want your words spoken. We want your destiny called forth. Because only when all of us are un unlocked will we have the fullness of who Jesus wants the bride to be. That's, that's what we're after, and that's why we want a treasure. And, and it's not just art. It's like every, every kind of creative thing. Your business, your parenting, your, uh, your writing, your thinking, your... Your, your tenderness, your, your ministry, your gifts. So, you know, there's a, there's a word in the New Testament called koinonia that's used all the time for what it means to be in fellowship. So, but, but core to the koinonia is that everybody plays. Everybody has uh, something to throw into the fire, I guess you could say. And actually, I was being reminded uh, last night and this morning of uh, years ago when I was in high school, I've become a Christian when I was very young. When I was in high school, we, we came on a trip from, I live in Colorado, we came on a trip, came to, uh, to uh, Forest Home on a, for a youth conference. And at this youth conference, they did this thing that some of you probably experienced, uh, I don't remember what it's called, but basically, we, it, the, the guy preached about lordship and said, you know, I talked about calling, giving your life totally to the Lord. And then we went out to a campfire outside. We all were given a stick. And, and he basically it was the ministry time, it was the response time. And he's basically saying, okay, so if you want to give yourself in a new way to the Lord, your life totally to the Lord, throw your stick in the fire, you know. It's like, so it's almost like you're saying, I'm throwing myself into the fire. And uh, so last night, actually, my wife was praying for me, and I, and I saw that image again. And I saw myself throwing the, myself into the fire. And then a cool thing the Lord did is he turned... The sticks, all the sticks of different people, into, and, and he turned it into the burning bush. And so every stick was all connected, and, and it was created into this bush. And the fire of God was on it that was bringing redemption to the world. But, you know, that story, the, the bush was not burned up. It was not destroyed. It was only like a, a vessel through which uh, the fire could, could burn. So, uh, so that's that's the passion that I have. There's an incredible verse that's that's been a prayer for many many years, in Song of Solomon, um, uh, eight. And, and it's, let me just read that. It says, "Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. It flashes, its flashes are like flashes of fire. The very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can floods drown it." And if a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, house he would be utterly despised. So that's an image of this mature love that comes to a point where nothing can destroy it, nothing can put it out, nothing can quench it, nothing can build it, build it down. But but the reality is that we have to contend for that, and we go through a process in life where there's a maturing process, and there's a there's a challenge to it. Um, I'd like you to put that picture on the, up on, of Jesus, of the face of Jesus right now. And uh, this painting right here of Jesus was painted by uh, this young gal. Uh, I think she's in her late uh, teens, maybe early 20s now, Akiana. Some of you may have heard of her before. But she, uh, she's a supernatural prophetic artist that's been totally trained by God. She's never taken an art lesson her whole life. Um, she, uh, when she was four years old, in an atheist family, never heard of God at all. She came to her mom one day and she'd drawn a picture. And her mom asked, well, who's that? I mean, she's, they didn't even have TV in their home. And, uh, and, and she said, it's my angel. Uh, this angel came to me and I drew a picture of my angel. And from that point on, she started doing all these drawings and paintings and the, and the Holy Spirit taught her and she came to Jesus uh, in, in these kinds of encounters. She ultimately was taken into heaven multiple times and she saw Jesus and she painted a painting of Jesus um, that 
I just found out, you know, a week or so ago, I didn't know this part of the story, but she basically, the, she had a, an art agent, and the art agent was a crooked, and he basically sold the, G, the original Jesus painting to someone uh, without her permission, and and it got lost for years, and they finally found it, but the guy won't give it up. He, he's got it locked in a safe, and nobody can see it, and, you know, whatever. So, Green stole the first painting, and so for many years she was grieved about that, and you know, because that was probably that was the the treasure. And so you've seen that other painting because it was in that movie where the little boy, you know, went to heaven and he recognized that was the Jesus he saw in heaven. And um, so recently, I, I think in the last year or two, she was commissioned to do some a project. And in the process of doing this project, it all came back, all the revelation of Jesus. And she started painting this, and this is the new the the new painting of Jesus. And what was struck me is I, if you compare the two paintings, the quality is even greater. It's the same face, but the quality is even at higher level. And I felt like it was a great picture of this maturing process of eyesight. She's growing as just as, as a person, but she's but it's also a picture of the, the greed of man stealing away the face of Jesus from the heart of the of this little bride. And and then but but it didn't really steal away and there's a restoration coming forth that says no I still see Jesus that's what we want to say I still see Jesus I want him and and so so that's why I want to paint on the front of this dress this burning this burning heart that's constantly saying no I will never give up many waters will not quench my love nothing can take us away we're going after the vision of who he is and I'm going to look for Jesus everywhere, everywhere in my life, even in the deepest crisis, even in the biggest losses, even when the enemy steals from me. I'm going after the face of my loving, loving Lord Jesus Christ that is always with me. Yesterday, we, uh, we were praying, my wife and I and, and my friend Joe, actually, we were praying for someone who just found out they have cancer. And, uh, and I was so uh, amazed again, and I just, I get blown away about when Jesus comes to someone in the midst of crisis. And, and uh, it was so tender. Two things that highlight, I'll just mention, I can't share a lot of details because I don't want to break that confidentiality, but uh, the reality is like two things happen with this person. One is, I want, I mean, he's, he saw Jesus just come to him and just hold him in his arms and he just sobbed in his arms. He just, just sobbing in his arms, just the intimacy, the, the tenderness of him being with him as he's facing this challenge in his life. And, and, but then the shock, then a difference, I mean, I, I kind of expected that to happen in one sense, I'll be honest. But then the next thing that happened was, I mean, a little later in the, in the time, he starts laughing his head off. It's like he was just roaring, almost falling out of his chair with joy. And we're just like, what's going on? He says, I just see Jesus laughing and he's just like not worried about this at all. And he's saying he's with me and he's never going to leave me and, and it's all okay. And he was like, and you could just see the stress just, you know, pouring off, off of him, breaking off of him. And uh, so that's, that's, that's the Jesus I know. Uh, the Jesus that, that releases us from, from the anxiety and the stress of this world and from the fear and the trauma of life. And, um, and so... Uh, I, uh, I just wanted to highlight that. And what I want to do is just take a, another minute to, to look at a story in the Bible that you're all very familiar with. And it's, it's from Luke, uh, Luke chapter 10. Could you put that up there? It's uh, the story of Mary and Martha. Oh, there goes the cup. <laughs> um, yeah. As Jesus and his disciples were on the way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You're worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and will not be and it will not be taken from her. So this is a, a precious story. I'm sure you've heard it preached many times before. 
The thing that the Lord highlighted to me when I was reading it today was uh, the phrase um, that basically where um, the Lord says, Martha, Martha, you're in this translation I'm reading here is English, uh, is anxious and troubled about many things. So the words anxious and troubled. And I was realizing that what happens to us and one of the things that steals our focus, steals us away from being able to see Jesus in our life is when we get anxious and troubled. You know, we, we, get, we get into that state of mind where uh, we're anxious and the, 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 the word worry, uh, maranau, uh, I'm probably not pronouncing that right in the Greek, to be anxious about, to be careful, to take thought, to divide and separate parts. It's, not, it's like internally you get divided. You're always like you're over here and you're over here and, and you're not sure how to put all things together and you can't synchronize. And there's a dynamic of I can't fit this together it's, and there's pain that comes in and there's a, a lot of dynamic going on like that. And then the other word, uh, I'm not going to even try to pronounce, but anyway, it's bothered. It means disturbed or troubled, to be troubled, disquieted, to make turbid, noisy, tumultuous, an uproar. So there's like an uproar on the inside of you that you're, you can't quiet your thoughts. Uh, you, you're running around, you know, you often think of the story of Peter when he's walking on the water and all of a sudden he starts looking at the waves, he starts sinking because he's lost his focus on Jesus. There's an anxiety that comes, okay? So one of our greatest battles in life is to handle the negative emotions that come from the traumas that come at us and the challenges that come at us. So learning how to be able to get back to a place of quiet and not uh, engage with all of that intensity and live our lives out, out of fight and flight syndrome, out of like, I'm going to fight this or I'm going to, you know, or I'm going to run from this or whatever. But we're able to get back to a place where we're quiet enough to be creative. Okay. So this is, uh, it struck me partly because I was, I do know in my own life and even experienced last night, I just confessed to you <laughs> my challenge last night. Okay. So whenever, whenever you're working on something, a creative project, a, a, a work project, or whatever it is, and you come up against challenges and you start getting triggered with some emotions, then uh, if you're in this high anxious state, it's very, very hard to be creative. In fact, uh, without going into a bunch of brain science, I just say that what happens is, you, it's almost like you're a swimmer out and you're drowning and you're beating off a lifeguard. It's like your system goes into that fight and flight syndrome and you can't think. And you can't be calm enough to be quiet and be creative. So it was interesting, a man came up to me right after the service last night and, and he was having panic attacks and he's in, a, he's in a job situation that's just freaking him out and he doesn't think he can keep in this job. And, uh, and, he, uh, and, and he just doesn't know what he's gonna do and he, and he just can't even think clearly, I could tell. He was exactly the state that I just described. So we spent a bunch of time processing how to quiet and we walked through and prayed and, and, and by the time we were done he was back in a peaceful state to be able to listen to God and to be able to take at least one practical step in a good direction so this is key to every arena of life I don't care whether you're doing the simplest job whether you're executive of a massive company no matter what it is at every level of life to be creative we have to quiet we have to be quiet enough inside and we have to be synchronized internally enough to be able to say, okay, so what, I'm looking at these alternatives and then, and then it's even more significant when we're trying to listen to the voice of God. So if we're in a high intense state, like I gotta hear God about this problem, that's a great way to not be able to hear God about the problem. And uh, you know, many times, uh, in, in my own life, I've like gotten frantic. I remember one time I was so depressed when my son was sick of cancer and, and I was in a meeting and it was a prophetic meeting and I was like, I gotta hear a word from God because I can't survive. I can't move. I can't move one more day out of this meeting. But I didn't get a word from God and I'm sitting there, I'm getting more and more and more depressed. And as like, I, I was, it was so painful that I finally, I was gonna leave. I was just like, I gotta get out of here. This it's actually making it worse because I'm seeing everybody else get blessed and I'm getting crushed. You know, that was the comparison dynamic. 
And the Lord just said a simple thing to me, and He just said, given it should be given to you. And so this was my way of escape from that anxiety at this point, is that I, I looked up, I could barely see because I was so depressed, and I looked across the room and I saw a friend getting prayed for, and I thought, well, maybe I can get over to there and help pray for him. So I'm craw almost crawling across the room to get to my friend to pray for him, and this guy, this pastor comes up to me and starts praying over me and prophesying over me and totally breaks the depression off me and calls forth this wonderful grace on my life. So, so there was a dynamic where by simply uh, being with Jesus, I mean, he was with me even though I couldn't perceive him. And the little bit that I could perceive was his voice saying, given should be given to you. And so by walking with him across the room, he knew that he, he had set up a sabotage to get, you know, a, prof a positive sabotage. He was, he was going to, uh, his Jehovah Sneaky was gonna, he knew all along he was gonna he was gonna get somebody to pray for me, but I but instead, uh, you know, he was getting me to focus on somebody else and not my problem. And that was part of the pro way it was broken as well. So so in the dynamic of learning how to oh, do we not have Jesus up there anymore? Keep Jesus up there. You should keep Jesus up the rest of the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's much better. Uh, actually, actually I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I did tell you to go to some other things, so I understand. Um, so, so we just want to we just want to see Jesus. That's what we're after. We want to be able to see Jesus, but also be Jesus. And this is uh, last little thing I'll say. And I want then I want to do uh, some some ministry and some worship and almost kind of intercession over this issue of. The sustaining and increasing this blue fire on your hearts. Okay, that's what we're after here. Um, but one other thing I want to say is that because Christ is in us, the hope of glory, Christ is in every one of you, he, he's, he wants to manifest that unique creative color of himself, that unique flavor of who he is through you. But the enemy wants everything to do to crush that, to hide that, to shut that down, to make you feel like you don't have anything that's valuable to give. You, you, you're, you're, not, you don't, you're not worth anything. And he wants to put out that light, okay? So, so I want to just affirm to you that everyone, if I look, I look in each of your eyes and in your face, every one of you have Jesus in you. And... And I want to say yes to Jesus in you. I want to say yes. And I want you to turn to some, the person next to you. Just, I just want you just to look at him for a second and just say, I say yes to the Jesus in you. Right here, just for a minute. And so, Lord, I want to just pray that you would break off. You would break off all the no's. All the no's that have come from the enemy, all the accusations, all the shame, all, all the I'm worthless, all the comparison, all of this stuff that holds us back from being able to manifest Jesus through our lives. And I know I've told this story before at some point, but I'll just tell again. I was at a John Wimber conference years ago. Uh, I think it was in Anaheim somewhere. Uh, and. We, this particular conference was across the street from a big mall. And we had gotten, I just got blasted by the Holy Spirit in ministry time. Just overwhelmed. And part of it, it was a vineyard. Uh, and, or part of it was, I had a vision of Jesus and he was looking in my eyes in the midst of this time. And I just got filled. And then we took this break and, and the Lord said, I want you to walk across over to the mall. And I want you to look in the eyes of people. Because I want to look through your eyes into their eyes. So all I did is walk through the mall. And one thing I discovered is very few people would look me in the eyes. <laughs> but, uh, but there were a number of people that did look at me in their eyes. And when I did, I just, I just looked at them just like he said. I said, like, okay, look through the eyes of, uh, in my eyes into their eyes. And, and it was astounding what happened. Almost everyone that I caught their attention, they stopped me. They said, don't I know you? I, I think I know you. 
and, and we get into this conversation, I was able to share Christ with multiple people simply by doing that. All I did was look in the eyes of Jesus, and they saw the eyes of Jesus in me. I had an experience on the beach where this lady comes up to me and says, uh, Jesus is in you, looking at me. Uh, uh, so, so, so the power of Him in you, looking through your eyes, look, touching through your hands, uh, moving through your heart and your life, we have to understand that, that we really do carry the presence of Christ in us. And when we walk into any place, we carry Him in. And if we would believe that and understand that I have a unique, uh, unique, unique ma manifestation of Jesus that I carry everywhere, and and we instead of being shamed, think oh, I'm just a, I'm just me, I'm just Ken, I just go around and whatever, uh, we get into this mode, this this sense of, of defeat and, and worthlessness. It, it's just it's just uh, it's exactly what the enemy wants to do. He wants to put out the flame. He wants to put out the fire. And he wants to put it out in us about ourselves, but even more, he wants to put it out so that we don't shine in the darkness. So we don't shine in the people that need, need who we are uh, and need our creative expression, the, our, the, poem, the poem of who we are. And so that's what we're after here, okay? So what I want to do right now is I'm, I, uh, I want the worship team to come back up. And... Um, we're going to we're going to do a song that they did uh, earlier. We're going to keep the the face of Jesus up there. And first, I'm going to just uh, as they start to just to play instrumentally first, just for a second, I'm going to read a prayer, and then I've asked our beautiful uh, prophetic dancer Kit to come and dance around this bride. And I want this to be like an intercession and, and an adoration time, just for a minute before we go into uh, our ministry time. Um, but uh, we just love you, Lord Jesus. We love you. We've given our lives to you. We want you manifested in the earth. We want you manifested in our lives. And so we're here before you and we're just saying, Lord, restore, light the fire again in our hearts where it's gone low. Take our little sticks as we throw ourselves into your fire. Would you, would you restore and, and, and make, make your bride beautiful? I'm just going to pray this prayer. We kneel before the all-consuming fire of the man, Christ Jesus, and invoke you to come and consume us. Make us a united and burning bride, broken in humility, resonating in heart with your spirit, and ignited with your blazing love. Release on us the spirit of burning, we come to be ignited by your word of fire and the engulfing flames of your presence. Holy Spirit, let your burning jealousy have its consuming way in our lives until every misplaced affection and false idol be completely burned away. And until one raging, all-consuming passion fills our entire being. Love for the altogether lovely man, Christ Jesus. Cause us to be contrite ones who are burning before your throne night and day like the Holy Spirit and blazing in this region as, a burning, as burning and shining lamps like John the Baptist was. Make us ministers of fire.
right now. I just, I feel exhausted. I, I feel distracted. Uh, and I'm, and uh, I, I need you. And then there's also uh, the possibility of many of you uh, that you just maybe get stirred by that the whole thought of creativity. And you would like to have more anointing for creativity, more freedom to be able to, to, to see what your destiny is. And, uh, and so feel free to come up in the mix here as well for that, for that as well. I think the Lord wants to pour all of this out. And so Lord, I just want to thank you for the wonder of who you are and the wonder of what you've called us to be. And we just, we, we just want to, we want to reset our eyes on you. We want to reset our hearts on you. And we, we know that you, you know exactly your, you, act, you know exactly what you made us to be. And you would know exactly how to call for the fire inside of us. And so I'm asking right now for the release of your anointing, your spirit on each of us as we stand here before you and we gaze into your face and we say, Lord, we want to be what you made us to be. We want our eyes to be your eyes. We want our hearts to be your hearts. We want our hands to be your hands, our feet to be your feet, our whole being to be, to be us consumed with who you are, but the unique flame that we each would carry. It's not like you want to burn us up and wipe us away. You want our stick to be in the bush. You want us to uniquely burn with the color of our flame. And so I'm asking God for the release of that creativity, that revelation, that freedom from the overwhelming challenges of life. Places we're stuck. I just just think of that, that those those who are facing sickness right now, all throughout the room, are here. Uh, that, that have just been persistently in the way, just every day. One more day, I'm facing the pain again. I'm facing the fear again. So Lord, we just say, Lord, come, come, strengthen our hearts. Come, break the power of the enemy. Come, deliver us and heal us. Lord, release that, Jesus. 